Bonjour et bienvenue à l'ILARA, l'Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute whose aim is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Today's roundtable will be in English, but I'll introduce our institute in French first. ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur, de la recherche et de l'innovation. Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines, et à leur culture. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours d'initiation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris, et étant donné la situation, en visioconférence. Vous y trouverez par exemple en ce moment des stages de grec et de latin, ainsi qu'un fabuleux cycle sur les judéolangues, en accès libre et gratuit, le lien Zoom se trouve sur notre page Facebook et sur notre site. Et d'autre part, une offre de vidéoconférence virtuelle, l'ILARA en ligne, disponible sur notre chaîne et dont la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA, met à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretiens, de conférences ou de tables rondes. Dans ce cadre de l'ILARA en ligne, nous avons inauguré un nouveau format en alternance avec les invitations individuelles celui de la table ronde. Il nous permet d'aborder un thème essentiel pour les langues rares en bénéficiant d'éclairages multiples. Le premier de ces thèmes est le multilinguisme à petite échelle qui caractérise quantité de sociétés rurales du monde. Au sein de celle-ci, les locuteurs, femmes, hommes, enfants, sont des polyglottes qui s'expriment au quotidien dans plusieurs langues locales. Pour coordonner scientifiquement ce thème riche et fondamental, à l'honneur ce dimanche pour la Journée internationale des langues maternelles, nous avons invité la professeure Friederike Lübke et lui avons donné carte blanche. Elle a choisi de décliner cette thématique en deux tables rondes. L'une, co-organisée avec Ruth Singer, a eu lieu la semaine dernière. Elle est en ligne en replay sur notre chaîne et nous a fait parcourir le monde pacifique, Australie, Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée, Philippines et Vanuatu, de manière tout à fait passionnante. Celle d'aujourd'hui concerne le monde atlantique et Frédéric Lubke vous en dira plus dans quelques instants. Mais pour ceux qui n'étaient pas avec nous la semaine dernière, je présente à nouveau notre invité. Frédéric Lubke est professeur d'études africaines à l'Université d'Helsinki depuis 2019. Elle était auparavant professeure de description et de documentation linguistique à la SOAS à Londres, où elle est toujours chercheure associée. Elle travaille depuis de nombreuses années au Sénégal, où elle a documenté et analysé plusieurs langues mandées et atlantiques, et s'est intéressée aux pratiques d'écriture, notamment à travers le projet Crossroads, les projets Crossroads et Liliema, qu'elle a initié et dont elle vous parlera sans doute. Très engagée dans l'étude des pratiques socio-historiques et linguistiques des petites communautés multilingues, elle est l'une des pionnières de ce domaine d'études émergents dont elle explore brillamment les problématiques. Sans plus attendre, je vous invite à découvrir ce multilinguisme extraordinaire avec Frédéric et ses invités. N'hésitez pas à leur poser vos questions, en français ou en anglais, à travers le chat en direct. Welcome to you all. Please ask your questions in the live chat, share your comments and participate. This roundtable is also yours. Frédérique, nous sommes très heureux de t'accueillir à nouveau cette semaine à Lilara pour cette seconde table ronde sur le multilinguisme à petite échelle. Many thanks and warm welcome to, as well to your panelists. And over to you now. Thank you so much, Amina. Merci beaucoup à nouveau um, à toi et à Ilara et uh, à toute l'équipe. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here again. Um, I should say um, that this series of two roundtables is um, by no means exhaustive in its cover of a small scale multilingual situations. Um, so, uh, this limitation is just due to my own personal focus and connections but there could be many more roundtables actually on this condition that is by far the most widespread mode of communication uh, in large parts of the world um, i'm very happy to be here today um, to move our gaze um, to an area west and west central africa um the uh, amazon and the black atlantic uh, that connects them 
an area of the world that is very uh, internally diverse, but bound together by a shared experience of uh, violent uh, colonization, which we will doubtlessly touch upon today as well. And I'm very happy to have uh, a diverse uh, panel. I'll introduce the panelists now in alphabetical order. So we have with us today Pier Paolo Di Carlo, um, researcher at the University at Buffalo in the US, who comes uh, um, and joins us today from Italy, though, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And um, one of the pioneers in the growing field of small scale multilingualism studies, a pioneer together with Jeff Good. Um, in research on small scale rural multilingualism in uh, Africa, and particularly in Northwestern Cameroon, and also the coordinator of a program that aims at inclusive health communication in the context of the COVID pandemic um, that we will touch upon in this round table. My next uh, invitee is Patience Epps. There she is um, in her office at the University of Texas at Austin. And we're very happy that she can be with us uh, despite uh, the power outages <laughs> that caused us some doubts this morning. And um, Patty um, has a research focus on indigenous languages of the Amazon basin, um, in particular on the uh, family of Nadehub languages in the upper Rio Negro one of the world's most famous small-scale multilingual settings. And she has published widely both on uh, grammars of individual languages, but also on multilingualism in the Amazon and on language contact in this area. Um, my next uh, panelist, Heinz van der Voort, um, also works on uh, Amazonian languages. Um, he is based at the Museo Parense Emilio Goldi in Belém, Brazil, and um, focuses on uh, isolates and macro J languages of Rondonia, Brazil, uh, settings that have been really dramatically affected um, by um, colonization. And he has a long-standing fieldwork experience on these languages that he will share with us. Um, finally, I'm very happy that we have with us uh, today from Nairobi, Kenya, but normally based in Hong Kong or sometimes in Berlin, where he is right now a recipient of the Alexander von Humboldt Prize, Kofi Yakpo, whose research focuses on uh, English lexified uh, creoles of West and West Central Africa. Um, but who has also conducted extensive research uh, in Suriname and who has a general interest in both the linguistic, structural, social linguistic, but also political and ideological aspects of contact languages in this world area. So after this round of introduction, without further ado, I suggest we move to our panel discussion. And uh, as we did uh, last week, we would like to actually invite our audience to get a glimpse of our very vibrant and colorful but different so social linguistic settings by giving a little vignette of everyday life in the settings in which the panelists work or which they have experienced. And um, Kofi, I would like to invite you to start and tell us a little bit of everyday linguistic life in a multilingual setting. Yeah, Frederica, thank you very much for, for the kind introductions of all of us. So past years, we've been working mainly on the Afro-Caribbean English lexifier Creole. So that's a family of Creole languages spoken in West Africa and in the Caribbean. And of course we have to Keep in mind that these languages were created by Africans and 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 African diasporic, um, well, diasporic Africans in the Americas during the European slave trade and during European colonialism. Um, 
So this involves, this is why this involves work on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, we've worked in Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Sierra Leone, Suriname, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. So these are, these are different countries, of course, but they're all characterized by, you know, what we would say a, a deep imprint of African descended communities um, who are either the majority or, or who constitute the kind of cultural reference group of many of these countries. Um, but typically these languages are part of multilingual, multilingual settings. So though we have a Creole language like in Suriname, Sananantongo, for example, or in Nigeria, Nigerian Pidgin, you will always have people shifting and switching languages. These languages are not in the tradition of monoglossic languages like in in particular, basically, they have complex um, setting. So one, one typical example, for example, is, is, is what I had during my research, where um, I'm recording in a backyard somewhere in Ghana, in my cousin's house, put the record on the participating in the conversation. And typically, young men or men who consider themselves to be young like me um, would speak in Ghanaian pidgin in an informal context right which is which is with the creole language but then what comes is you have different multilingual episodes um and these these multilingual um episodes are such that you will have people calling for example making phone calls and then the person who is talking to me in Ghanaian Pigeon will switch to Akan, um, talking to somebody on the phone. Then my cousin's wife comes in into the courtyard um, and asks us if we want to drink something that would be in Ghanaian standard English. Then somebody gets um, switches languages because he, he or she, well, there were actually only guys at that moment, but he assumes that we, we all speak Akan as well. And then he would drop in a phrase or two in a can. At some point, um, one of the members of the group started singing a song with an acoustic guitar and switched over to one of his native, native languages, which is Frafra, a language of the north of Ghana. So the entire song was in Frafra. And he'd explain to us what the song was on because it's, it's, a, more, it's a smaller, more regionally confined language. And at some point also, my, my cousin would switch to Ewe. Um, which is the language, you know, we share apart from Ghanaian Pidgin and, and Ghanaian English, you know, highlighting something, a punchline or something. So th these are the kind of typical multilingual um, contexts where people lead a normal conversation with a, a multiplicity of languages. And, and it's not in the sense that there's some kind of functional, you know, need to do that. It's part of the of the conversation. It's part of how you structure and how you 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 know how you express yourself and your identity as as a as a fluid person you could say so i could actually say you know um the question why would people be multilingual in a conversation already betrays a monolingual bias that has the expectation that people would be monolingual but for multilinguals maybe we should actually ask question the other way around. Why would somebody who has so many resources at their disposal be monolingual? Exactly, I think, I think this is exactly what it is. So basically it's, it's rather interesting for me when I get back from these settings to see how people only communicate in one language when I go to Germany or, or you know, France where at least in public spaces, of course we shouldn't forget that Europe is linguistically extremely diverse one you go into immigrant communities, once you look at the dialectal range. Um, I once had, and let me add this quickly, I won't, I won't um, keep others from talking, but I once had a similar situation, a deja vu of West Africa when I was on the northern coast of Germany in a very, very local kind of restaurant um, where suddenly I realized that somebody at the bar was switching between Frisian, Low German, and Standard German within one conversation. And that is the kind of multilingualism that is very characteristic of, it was basically the default in the settings that we work in. 
but which is dying in Europe, which is still in pockets you still have, but which is dying in Europe. Pier Paolo, you are probably going to take us to Northwestern Cameroon now and give us a little impression of how multilingualism shapes social life there. Well, uh, thanks, Frederica, and I'm very happy to be here and to share uh, this afternoon with uh, all of these uh, wonderful colleagues and with and with the audience uh, too. Um, so let me just briefly introduce uh, the vignette with uh, a lived experience. I mean, with my own uh, experience, because I am I am I, I study that kind of multilingualism, but I don't. I'm not a practitioner of that multilingualism. Um, so as I, so the first time I went to Cameroon was 2010, and the reason why I was there uh, is because I, I, I had been hired by Jeff Good to, to be part of his team, but multilingualism was not uh, in our agenda at all. The, the very word multilingual or multilingualism were just absent from our research project uh, narratives. I mean, we just didn't care about multilingualism. We didn't even think of it. Um, so uh, during my field work, uh, uh, so we were, uh, so I was part of this team. We were in Lower Fungum because Lower Fungum is a linguistic hotspot in uh, Central West Africa, in a very tiny, in a relatively small region that is the size of the city of Amsterdam, about, about 250 square kilometers, say 13 by 13 kilometers. I mean, very, I mean, relatively small. Uh, there are no less than, say, so the linguists would recognize no less than seven distinct languages uh, spoken in 13 small villages uh, in a population of, in total, no more than, say, 15,000 people. I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, it's a it's a real it's a, there's a great density of languages in these small villages uh, scattered in this uh, hilly area, and this was the see the, the, the focus of our research. Uh, we we wanted to understand how come all these languages are spoken in this small pocket of land, and that was my my main goal uh, because I had uh, mostly. I mean, an ethnographic agenda. I had to, to study the, the, the cultures and interview people about their genealogies and describe the, the so whatever was kind of more social and cultural rather than linguistic. And but I, I sort of noticed uh, at some point after several weeks that I was there that there were people who uh, were called by a name in a given village and with a different name in another village. And so at the beginning, I thought, okay, those are just nicknames. Like in my case, um, there are people who call me Franco, even if I'm Pierpaolo, but just, that is just a joke because there are Francos that, uh, I mean, there are, it's real, this is real. In, in, a, in, a, in a certain group of, of friends, there are people who call me Franco. So I thought that it was that kind of thing. But uh, then I, I later realized that it was not at all uh, like that. I mean, it was really the way the, the, the people that I was working with, um, uh, they got their, their names, uh, had a lot to do with the, the families of origin of their fathers and mothers. And so uh, I started uh, getting interested in that and I asked uh, many questions and I found out that uh, practically everybody has at least two sets of names, one for father's affiliations and one for mother's affiliation. Also interestingly was that uh, uh, if the father and the mother come from two different villages uh, that are associated with different codes, so with different languages, so to say, the, so the child is, is expected to learn both and to speak the right code with the right family. So this started giving me the idea that there were really multiple identities. I mean, it was a separate name corresponding to a separate language that was spoken with a select say, group of people. And I tested this hypothesis many times. Um, and I can say, it's basically correct. And this is what is really striking of that area, that uh, in such a small pocket of land, um, many, I mean, I would say really the overwhelming majority of, of people uh, 
uh, have multiple identities available that can be activated uh, through the use of uh, one or the other language and that correspond to a, I mean, a full-fledged identity. Uh, also because those names are, I mean, the names, the different sets of names that change across families are not just, uh, are made of uh, not random names, but are family-specific names. So whenever someone is called by a given name, many people will understand what family they are referring to, because that is a, a name specific to a given family. And um, I don't know if uh, I mean I'm, I'm, uh, maybe I can I can take two or three more minutes to just to 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 tell you briefly one of the I mean, most glaring examples of of multilingualism there that is also something different from what Kofi uh, just uh, said uh, because in the area in Lower Fungum um, this uh, fluid switching between different languages is not the norm. In fact, it's, it's kind of, uh, say, for, quote unquote, forbidden. Tra traditionally, people stick with a given language when they speak to a person, unless they, they switch to Pidgin English, that is the lingua franca, that is understood by uh, uh, everyone. So, um, switching between, say, uh, Abba and uh, Fang or Koshin is a, a, a socially very meaningful act. So there's this scene, uh, this comes from the research of a student who, of, uh, of mine uh, who participated in the wider uh, PAM CAM project, um, Rachel Ojong. So there are two men um, and they share a number of codes, local codes plus PG English. And they are, they're also related to each other because one is the brother of the wife of the other. Um, so they they speak uh, and they they choose to so they, they they start speaking in the language of the older one, of the older man, uh, and they continue speaking. So if, even ignoring the the, the content, you know, they and they speak they they stick to the to the to this code. At some point, the other man uh, switches to another code, and the the older so the the, the older man's uh, uh, reaction is oh you're just a child and leaves <laughs> and is really disgruntled by by this act and the the whole story is that the older man was scolding uh, the the younger one and the younger one say kind of tolerated this scolding for a few minutes and then at some point just <laughs> God said, okay, this is enough. I will just switch to another language. And this, I'm sure that this will politely, relatively politely, tell the other person, I don't want to have anything to do with you right now. Please leave. Thank you, Pier Pier Paolo, for, for sharing both your experience and this wonderful vignette with us. It's interesting um, that um, there is something um, that you mentioned that also emerged during the last round table and also characterizes my own experience that very often Western or outsider linguists kind of stumble into multilingual situations. Um, so we become multilingualism researchers by accident and then somehow converted from solace to polis, so to speak. Um, which begs important questions about, you know, uh, the role of outsiders and the role of stereotypes and biases in research that I'm sure we will touch upon. But I'd now like actually to jump over the Atlantic and give Patty the chance um, to introduce us to multilingualism in the Upper Rio Negro. Okay, thank you so much Federica and Amina for um hosting this round table. And again, I too am very happy to be here with all of you. So um, as Friedrich uh, pointed out, the area that I work in is the Upper Rio Negro region in the Northwest Amazon. So um, this is, my work is all in the Brazilian side, but the region itself um, also spans uh, part of Colombia as well, or extends into part of Colombia. And this is a region that, uh, as Friedrich pointed out, has been pretty uh, roundly discussed in the literature for the multilingualism that exists there. Um, and this multilingualism is best known in the context of um, East Tucanoan peoples, 
um, and also Taviana, who are speakers of an Arawakan language. And so we know quite a bit about this work, about this, uh, this situation from um, work by people like Arthur Sorensen, Janet Jackson, uh, sorry, Jean Jackson, <laughs> Janet Trinella, Christine Stenzel, um, Alexandra Eichenwald, and, and quite a few others. Um, and I'll say just a few words about this context and then move to the context that I'm more familiar with or have worked in more, more consistently, uh, which is another part of this very, com actually very complex multilingual area. So among the East Tukanoan peoples and the Tariana, as many of you have probably heard, there's a practice of linguistic exogamy that um, for most of these groups is pretty rigidly prescribed. So um, you don't really have much choice about this. You really have to marry to a different language group. Um, the villages are normally composed of, um, they're associated with a particular male line um, and a particular language that's associated with that male line and women marry in. Um, and the women are speakers of other languages from the region. So children grow up in this very multilingual area and most of the East Tukanoan people, um, at least traditionally, have been bilingual or multilingual in you know, five, six or more languages um, of which they identify primarily with their father's language, but they are competent in other languages as well. So the a way that the multilingualism plays out in this context is really quite complex. And there seems to be a range of multilingual behaviors that we've been learning more and more about through ongoing work by colleagues in that area. Um, so there's a fairly rigid version of multilingual behavior there, which is this receptive multilingualism or passive multilingualism, where people identify so strongly with their, their father's language that that is a language that they speak most of the time. Um, and so it's very common there to have these multilingual conversations where um, people are speaking different languages to each other and people don't think anything of it. It's completely normal behavior there. Um, it's also been discussed in the literature that intracentential code switching, for example, is really generally pretty frowned on. You keep your languages distinct. Um, but in general, um, there, there, but there is a range of behavior so that uh, work by, for example, Chris Stenzel and Wilson Silva have pointed out that in some communities there's a bit, quite a bit more flexibility than um, some of these discussions of very rigid receptive multilingualism would um, speak to. And it seems to be the case that there's the general, uh, a sort of generalization here is that there's a view that your father's language is your primary language. This is relatively immutable. Um, but that depending on the degree to which you need to kind of work to, to um, uphold that identity, um, the degree to which you are rigidly focused on speaking your father's language is flexible depending on sort of how much you have to, how much work you have to do to kind of maintain that identity in the social sphere that you're in. Um, the, the people that I work directly with are the hoop Hoop people, um, and this is a. These are speakers of a not, uh, language of the Nadahoop family, and this is the other kind of side of the multilingual zone. Um, so the Nadahoop peoples are um, are uh, they are more associated with hunting and gathering. They live more in the interfluvial zones, so they have a somewhat different kind of set of practices from the the more riverine peoples who engage in linguistic exogamy. The Nadahoop peoples do not practice linguistic exogamy, but they are in regular processes of exchange and interaction with other groups in the region and are generally bilingual or multilingual in some cases in East Tukanoan languages. But that multilingualism in this case is one-sided. So the Tukanoan people generally do not reciprocate by speaking hoop. So that's distinct from the Tukanoan situation where it's much more unil or bilateral or multilateral. Um, but nevertheless, the hoop people um, show a similar sorts of language practices, so a close association of group and language, the idea that you speak your own language, but you imitate the languages of others, um, and that it's generally fairly immutable, that your identity and your language are something fairly immutable. But there are some interesting exceptions to this immutability. And there are cases in the region of people who intentionally switch language affiliation and in so doing generally seem to basically be switching their whole ethnic affiliation and this whole kind of package of behaviors that's associated with that. So Wilson Silva has an interesting example of a Desano man who he was going to become Sirianos so that he could marry a Desana woman. 
um, he switched his language, he switched his, his affiliation, and everybody kind of let it go. Um, and I've also um, interacted with a few Hoop people who have done the same thing and have basically just kind of decided they were going to speak to Kano. And in those cases, the language use really seems to be very rigid with respect to receptive multilingualism um, in some very interesting ways. So um, hopefully that sort of sets the stage and I'll just give a couple of short vignettes um, of what life is like in that context. So drawing mainly on my own um, experience living in Hoop communities for fairly long periods of time. So um, I'll give three very short vignettes um, in the interest of time. So the first is um, it, a drinking party and festival in the Hoop community of Bajera Alta. And so we're in the, in, the, um, in the community, there's large quantities of maniac beer and a number of Tucanoan or Tucano speaking guys show up to the party. Um, while they're there, they walk around and talk to everybody. The who people only speak Tucano with them. So this is, reflects this, this unilateral bilingualism. Um, but meanwhile, they complain in hoop in front of the guys that they haven't contributed any tobacco. They have uncomplimentary nicknames for them in hoop. Um, so they sort of make fun of them in, by using hoop. But when they're speaking directly with them, they're only speaking Tucano. Um, and they stick to this pretty rigidly, although interestingly, as people get more and more drunk, you find more, more mixing such that the kind of mixing that normally would not be, um, not, you wouldn't encounter it. So, you know, some interest in potential switching between hoop Tucano and Portuguese. Um, a second vignette also shows the kind of rigidity of language use in certain contexts. Um, so this was a situation in the Upper Chiquilla River um, and there is a hoop community adjacent to a uh, Tuyuka community. So the Tuyuka are one of the East Tucanoan groups. Um, and I was spending time in both communities. So I had gone there to visit. It wasn't a community that I, I, had, I was established in. I'd gone there to visit. Um, and so I was on a walk from the hoop community where everybody's speaking hoop to the Tuyuka community together with two hoop boys. And as we are going, so at this point, I spent plenty of time in the region. I spoke hoop pretty well. So we're conversing in hoop. We're having a really nice conversation on the trail through the woods. But once we enter the village clearing, where we're sort of entering this Tuyuka sphere, where, of course, within this, in this village, you've got all the men of the village and the, the people who are growing up in that village speaking primarily Tuyuka. You have the inmarrying women and speaking Tucano and, and other languages all, and you know with again different degrees of flexibility as I'm walking with the hoop boys we're speaking hoop as the, as soon as we enter the village sphere they switch to Tucano and what was striking of course was that I I don't really speak Tucano so suddenly we are unable to communicate and so just like that we walk out of the forest and we can't talk to each other anymore <laughs> and one a, a final very quick vignette um, so in the hoop community, Bajera Alta, again, where I spent a lot of time, um, there was a woman there who um, is married to a hoop man. She has children. Everybody in the family identifies as hoop. Um, but she, as a young woman, made this decision that she was going to, in some sense, switch her identity, at least partly to that of a Tucano person. So from the Tucano model, the fact that she's married to a person who speaks a uh, hoop if she identifies in some way as Tucano, this fits the Tucano model. So she speaks Tucano all the time, even though everybody around her speaks hoop to her. So constant receptive multilingualism. Um, I was living there and working quite, uh, quite uh, regularly with her husband on the language, spending a lot of time with their family. And I would often go with them to, um, to help them work in their maniac garden. Um, but in me, she had something that I think that she had never encountered before, which is somebody who spoke hoop but did not understand Tucano at all. Um, and she didn't speak Portuguese. So I was spending a lot of time with their family, but everything she and I said to each other had to go, well, she, I could speak directly to her because she could understand my hoop, but everything she said to me had to be translated. And one day she and I were together in a canoe and it was just the two of us and we we're drifting in the river and we're drifting backwards up towards the bank and there's a big tree branch that was 
that was coming towards us as we were drifting backwards. I didn't see it because we were drifting backwards. It was just about to whack me in the head. And she suddenly starts to gesture and yell, but only in Tucano. So I figured out in time that I needed to turn around and look and I didn't get hit in the head. But um, it's, it's a, I think for me, this was a very sort of striking uh, illustration of how rigid the language choice can be in some situations. Again, this doesn't apply to everybody in the region. It's very dependent on situation and, and person and sort of long-term situation. But it's a, you know, she, she could have spoken to me at who, presumably, but she chose not to. So that's, that's that. Well, thank you so much for these very rich examples, which I hope uh, successfully illustrate that, you know, there's something we are always asked by typologists and that tell us how it works, right? Tell us the parameters that, actually um, our settings are very very localized and intricate and internally diverse and we really need to pay attention to all these social and ideological and cultural parameters um, before we arrive at generalizations but it also seems that there's one potential universal that is confirmed in your vignette namely that people the more they drink the more multilingual they become um, so take that home, typologists, please. And uh, but now, actually, we talked about the importance of names, and um, we have many, many people uh, who said hi in the YouTube chat. So before I get to the next vignette and last vignette, I would just like to greet people and and read their names to you. Um, and actually, some of the people that were already mentioned, researchers, are here with us. So I see Evani Viotti, hi, uh, Alex Francois, somebody called Ipsis, uh, my student uh, uh, Sarah Bourdieu, uh, Bruna Francetto, Rachel Artighe, Esmeralda Vailatin Negrao, Doris Ajong, um, C. Dot y. W. Emeka. Onwego Biza, Dora Savoldi da Rocha, Azevedo, hi Dora, somebody called Parquao, Agabi O, Muku Saxena, Alexander Kovina, hi Alex, nice to see you, Marva Murad Hussein, Nej Rochon, Chris Stenzel is with us, great, uh, Ana Livia Agostinho, um, Pratiti Palid, Bien Dubuy, James Asekfe, hi James, hi to Florida. I saw Fiona McLaughlin is also with us. Um, uh, Rahel Dires from uh, University of Helsinki. Um, Masinissa Garaun, sorry if I mispronounce names here. Mekri Boboafor, Suelen A. Pereira, Tonyas Venstra, Jean Carlos Pereira Höller. Wellington Santos da Silva, Christian Döhler, who was in last week's roundtable, Stefan Schulz, also from Helsinki. Um, who's next? Valentina Schiattarella, hi, I think she's in Naples. Um, um, Wilson de Lima, who you also mentioned, Patty. Um, who, um, do, 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 do. Silva Nurmio, a colleague of mine in Helsinki. Promise Dot Di Joao Eusebio Imbatene, and yeah, Fiona I mentioned, and Bruna, who already commented. So we have a fantastic audience here. And I hope we get many interesting questions and comments. And also before I move on to Heinz vignette, I have to confess that I omitted one panelist who couldn't make it, but I nevertheless would like to introduce her. And this is Stephanie Wanga, who you've seen on the announcement. Um, she is based at LSE in London, and unfortunately she couldn't uh, be with us for family reasons, but I would really, if she watches this now live, or if she watches the recording, wanted uh, to thank her for her willingness to participate and, uh, and say hi. Good. And now we have one last vignette, and Hein will take us to Rondonia, I believe. Hello, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's really nice to be on this, this very interesting panel. I've learned so much. I, I listened to the, to the last week's uh, session also, part of it. I, I had time to, to see the, uh, part of it. And I really learned of many things. And I, I became aware of many things 
uh, with regard to small scale um, uh, multilingualism. Unfortunately, I, I don't really have many sensational examples and experience of small scale multilingualism in the region where I work. Um, I work in Rondonia um, mainly, and uh, which where I have been since uh, since the mid 90s when I started to do field work there on one of the languages. Rondonia is an extremely diverse region with regard to languages and language families. Uh, there are three language isolates which are close to each other. On the other side, it's, it's on the border with Bolivia, uh, on the other side of the Guapore River, which forms part of the border. There are more families and more isolates, so this whole region is extremely diverse. Um, unfortunately, uh, for linguistic research uh, and for anthropological research, um, the region has become really not the only for anthropology and linguistics, but also for biology and many other sciences that are interesting in the in biocultural diversity of the Amazon. Rondonia is highly destroyed during the past century, especially the last 50 years. It was deforested. Um, uh, indigenous peoples were dislocated. Um, diseases have raged, contagious diseases like influenza, measles, etc. So this high diversity, it still exists, um, but the languages are, the groups are small and the languages, the speaker numbers are even smaller. Um, since colonization has, has gone so fast in this region, uh, within a century, everything has been turned upside down there. And nowadays, um, most indigenous people have been located or relocated in specific uh, indigenous areas. Yeah? And, um, and that's where the last speakers of all these languages live. And um, what I, it's probably uh, the case that in so-called traditional times uh, that there has been small scale multilingualism. It's almost certain that there, there are traces in the, contact traces in the language that uh, point to this, but uh, we can only try to reconstruct it on the basis of the memory of the elderly people and on the basis of some few uh, uh, reports, scientific reports. I should mention uh, the researcher, the early anthropologist, uh, uh, Ebel Nordenschild, who, who was there in, in a little part of, of this region uh, on the upper uh, Kurumbiara River, and um, especially uh, uh, Heinrich, uh, Emil Heinrich Schnettlage, who was there in the 1930s, in the mid-1930s, and spent more than a year going from river to river and meeting all these indigenous peoples there, uh, many of whom never really had any contact uh, with foreigners or outsiders. So he um, he, he could document some of it. Huh? Already the, the, the contagious diseases had ravaged uh, parts of those peoples, but still uh, the, 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 the social systems um, were still sort of functioning. Huh? Um, nowadays, we don't have that anymore. Uh, oh yeah, I should mention Franz Kaspar, of course, very important. And uh, my experiences are more with the, the people on the on, on three in three regions really. Uh, I presently I work in uh, on the upper Rio Pimenta Bueno um, area where you have a, an indigenous area with some two or three rem, remnants of indigenous languages. Uh, one is uh, the majority language spoken there, Aikana, a language isolate, and then between the speakers of of Aikana, you have some uh, speakers of Kwaza, which is a minority ling language within this community. Uh, the speakers of Kwaza tend to be uh, also, also multilingual in uh, Aikana, but not the other way around. They don't tend to be the other way around, uh, even though ethnic identities may differ. <laughs> and uh, of course, I should mention that everyone is uh, 
speaks Portuguese nowadays. Uh, almost all indigenous people of Rondonia uh, speak uh, Portuguese as well as a lingua franca. Uh, this is one region where I do a lot of work. Uh, presently, I'm wrapping up a project in the Dogus program, document, documentation program. Um, but uh, some years ago, I also worked intensively in the upper Rio Branco River, where especially Emil Heinrich Snedlager and Franz Kaspar, Franz Kaspar is known from his, his fabulous work on the Tupari people. And uh, the people at the Rio Branco, um, in the 1920s, 30s, it became a rubber concession. So you had all this these foreigners or outsiders coming in and exploiting, really enslaving also people on the rubber plantations. And uh, at some point, uh, several indigenous peoples of the region were sort of, I call it deported, but they, they were relocated, the government likes to say relocate, I say deported, to another area, really, you couldn't push them further off the map of Brazil any further. On, on the reserve, what used to be called Ricardo Franco, it's now called Rio Guaporé, which really is on the Guaporé River in the West. Um, the remnants of, of 10 different ethnic groups are located there. Um, the elderly people remember uh, where they come from. They remember the diseases. Uh, um, they are sometimes multilingual. Some people even speak three or, or four languages but uh, the young people are, some, peop some languages are still relatively strong, huh? such as, uh, yeah, there is some Makurap and there is some Yoromichi and there is some uh, Wari, but uh, most of the other languages are almost gone. Like Wairu and Arua and Kanoe is, is practically gone in that region, Kanoezo. These are languages, they are isolates, they are language of the Tupi family, they are language of the Macroje family. I worked on Arikapu there. Arikapu nowadays has probably only one speaker left in my time. There was one speaker on the Rio Branco, where they originally are from, and another speaker had already been relocated 40 years ago to the Rio Guapre. Um, so that's, that's more or less the situation in Rondonia with regard to small scale multilingualism, uh, the languages show traces of contact. Uh, it's not just loan words, it's also grammatical structures. So that's a region, a, re a reason why I think it, there is a aerial diffusion, but parts of this may also, or, or are certain to, to point to uh, traditions of small scale multilingualism. But unfortunately it's, it has been much destroyed. People sometimes remember, uh, still sing songs in another language, but they don't know what the songs mean. So that's that's something that's, that was left over. Yeah, that's basically uh, what I have encountered. In, uh, it, it's, we have to try to reconstruct it, maybe, if we want to say more about it. And look at, at work like uh, uh, Emil Heinrich Snedlake's book, uh, which is over a thousand pages, the Guapare Expedition, which is being translated into Portuguese. It has been translated in Portuguese um, now, and we hope it will be published this year. It's a fantastic uh, uh, um, report. It's, it's his field diaries of the 1930s of, of a situation when uh, yeah, well, people still live them in their traditional context and um, and people may still remember the names of those mentioned in these diaries. And it's one of the very few documentations of the original situation of the region. So that's basically the situation that I've encountered. Thank you, Hein. And um, this is a very sad story and we will revisit um, the question of um, why multilingual settings not only change, we have to assume that every setting changes, but are destroyed so dramatically 
and what the differential impact of settler colonialism is in, in different settings in, in Amazonia, for instance, where not all settings are equally affected. We'll get back to this question in a little while. Um, before I move to the next question, I would like to greet more people who are in the audience. Um, so we have Margot van den Berg, Jeff Good, hi Jeff, Araba Duncan, Aji Badejoy, Florian Lyonnais, Olivier Bondel, um, and there's more, Stéphane Robert, after Colli. Wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues uh, with us. So please um, ask your questions. We will get back to them towards the end of the round table. Um, so now I would really like uh, us to uh, look a little bit at how the type of multilingualism that um, we just describe these very diverse local constellations, how they are different from the multilingualism that researchers experience in their life, which also may cause this initial expectation of not actually finding a multilingual situation, but a small monolingual village community. And so I would uh, like to invite Pier Paolo to uh, start and give his take on this. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the um so um well let's say first of all that um so multilingualism so multilingual practices uh when they're not necessary at the communicative level which is like in this situation now for instance i'm speaking english because otherwise um, many people who are collect uh, connected wouldn't understand me I could switch to Italian, but probably I would be speaking just to Valentina Schiattarella and a few other people who can speak Italian. And um, so, but that, this is not the kind of multilingualism that we focus on, be it small scale or large scale or normal, say, multilingualism. So the multilingualism we're talking about now is a multilingualism that has some, some saliency, some salience. And um, and what kind of salience? Is a, is a social, uh, say, extralinguistic salience um, and in this regard can be considered a form of, of variation. So I can choose between a code or another code or in other contexts where there are not many codes available, uh, like for instance, in, in Italy, that is a largely monolingual country, um, the same kind of effects can be uh, um, created uh, through the choice of a variant of a certain pronunciation of a word or even just uh, through a lexical choice. So I would um, I would just like to to stimulate a little exercise, a little experiment uh, to <clears throat> who so to, to to the people who are watching uh, this video and also to all of you if you like, and uh, try to think of the last twenty four hours and of the reasons why so the motivations for your linguistic choices. So if you are multilingual or you are in a situation in which there is much code switching going on. Think of why you switched from a language to another language, from a code to another code in a, in a certain interaction. If you're not multilingual or you live in a, in a non, uh, say, multilingual setting, uh, try to think of why you used a certain variant, or why you pronounced a word in a certain way, and why you chose that word instead of that other word. And I guess that, like me, you will find out uh, that in most cases, you the main motivation um, has has to do with the, the representation of identity that uh, we want others to have of us. So the the the, the image that the, we want uh, the others to uh, have of us, and there's nothing new uh, in this, but of a certain kind of identity. Um, for instance. Mm, let, when you interact, like now, we are in a semi-academic, say, in, in a, an academic environment, although it's open also to non-academics, and it's it might be important to choose the right word, the right the words that uh, that uh, uh, refer to a certain author or to a certain uh, school of thought. And, and this is because we want to make sure that the others, uh, that those who lis are listening to us are, uh, are sure about our reliability as a scholar or as a, 
uh, yeah, I mean, as a, for our competence uh, on what we do. And so it means that we, uh, this is a type of person. It's not, uh, uh, say, um, uh, being brother to or father to. I'm not uh, aiming to be uh, so seen and, and um, by the others as a brother or father to someone else, but as a type of person, as an abstraction. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of a population of, uh, say, scholars. Or if I want to appear as a progressive-minded uh, as opposed to a conservative-minded or um, ecologist or what have you. If you, if you think through your linguistic choices over the past 24 hours, I bet you will find a number of examples in which your choices have been led by considerations of this kind. And, uh, and if, we, if you live in a multilingual uh, situation, uh, you will also see that there are a number of cases in which the multilingual choices will be functional to this kind of representation. In, the, so in, in Lower Fungum, and uh, for what we know also in other uh, contexts where um, small-scale multilingualism has been documented, this motivation is not absent, I mean, is present, is there, but is not as prominent as in our ideologies. Uh, when, um, for instance, in Lower Fungum, uh, in order to understand why someone has switched from a certain language to another language, uh, in a given interaction where it was not forbidden, for instance, or uh, you must know a lot about the social networks in which that person is member. Because uh, the, the, the choice is salient at the level of what kind of relations are, are represented, not the kind of types of person. This was the second, say, quote unquote, discovery that really surprised me when I when I saw that because I kept uh, so following on the so main uh, so mainstream uh, sociolinguistic literature on uh, on multilingualism of the soci of the sociology of language uh, kind so I kept asking questions about uh, so that aimed at clarifying what kind of prestige people may, might have uh, gotten by using a certain language over another. But I mean, the result was zero. People really didn't actually understand what I meant by prestige. I, mean, I, I, I didn't use the word prestige, of course, but there are, so the, the, all the uh, answers were very evasive, meaning, and I, I, at some point I just stopped and realized, okay, maybe they just, they don't care, but they don't, they're not choosing one language over another to represent a certain prestige. So what are they representing? They're representing relations. Uh, when they choose a certain language, as I said before, uh, in, my, in my earlier uh, intervention, uh, so when they choose a certain language, they, they are son to their father. And when they use another language, they are son to their mother. And this means that they have different uncles and different aunts and different uh, cousins. So they, they stress one over the other uh, web of relations. And this is really central in the motivations for using the local languages. Then the, what we have in common with lower fungum uh, uh, speakers is, uh, uh, is what they do with English. They use English in that case to uh, say, represent a sort of prestige, especially for scolding uh, children. Yes, I always knew that I was in trouble when my father spoke high German to me. Um, so um, <laughs> it's interesting what emerges from what you are just telling us as an added motivation for multilingualism that also defies many conceptions of how multilingualism works, that um, you don't necessarily have one relation with one person that is expressed through one language only. Because you can actually share multiple networks with one person and can express various positions in these networks through various languages. 
Um, and this is something that I've experienced a lot um, in my own field side, um, where this default sharing, so we share multiple languages, multiple experiences, and we can play with that. And that creates a deeply multilingual conversation. But we can also rely on your foreground one relationship only, and then be in a more monolingual mode. Um, now, I wonder, Kofi, you do not only have worked or work in many different multilingual settings, but you have also experienced many different types of multilingualisms in your personal professional life. I wonder, how do you see or do you see a difference between what you research and what you live? And if so, where and when and how? So maybe one one thing that I can see when I listen to to um, our colleagues here on the panel is that we are really de dealing with different types of multilingual uses usage patterns, right? So the vignette I gave, which was Accra, urban, you know, where you had a Creole slash Pigeon Ghanaian Pigeon being used as a language of interaction with other languages coming in. Um, is not a template that you'd find everywhere, right? In more rural areas of Ghana, for example, rural areas of Cameroon, um, even in the Caribbean, you will find more monolingual patterns. I wouldn't say monoglossic in the sense that, um, you know, there's an ideology that affirms that you have to speak one language, but definitely the main language of interaction uh, might be a majority language that's spoken in that area, right? But what is striking then is if you look at the Creole languages, um, you will see exactly the opposite, namely that basically being a competent speaker of Pichi in Equatorial Guinea means being able to code switch with Spanish, right? And for example, I had this very, very interesting um, uh, scene once when I arrived in Equatorial Guinea, um, I was at the airport and there were two or three Nigerian traders, women who were before me and they were speaking Nigerian pidgin to the customs official. And the customs official distanced himself very quickly and was like, you know, he was kind of bullying them, you know, what is this? Where did you, you have to pay tax on this, so, 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 right? And, and I was thinking, I was sweating. I was thinking, my God, I have a recorder, I have a computer, I have a hard disk, I have all sorts of stuff in my, <laughs> in my suitcase. And then my turn comes and I, I start speaking pichi to him and I do what Equatorians do, namely, I use all the numbers in Spanish, I use the weekdays in Spanish. I switch at certain points in the conversation to Spanish. I use a Spanish, Spanish noun. I don't say go up, go down. I say baja, sube. And suddenly that's it. I walk through, no problem, finish, right? So it, it, shows, it shows really that this kind of multilingual switching, at least in that case, it's bilingual, is part of the linguistic system. There's no way you can separate Pichi and Spanish. Of course, the template somehow, the grammatical template is Pichi. The same in Suriname, where with Sananantongo, at least with later varieties of Sananantongo, the Creole language, which is English based in Suriname, you have a similar situation where, um, where basically a well-formed sentence in Sananantongo of today, I'll, I'll come back to that, includes Dutch derived vocabulary, right? So for example, the president, um, when I was there held a speech and he had this, he had this capacity to draw you know, support from the people by speaking Sananantongo and thus breaking the practice of Surinamese elites to use Dutch mainly in public discourse. He started using the Creole and used it very successfully by speaking a very, very elaborate form of code mixed Sananantongo with Dutch appealing to multiple audiences at the same time. And, and this has changed. Certainly older traditional users of Sananantongo are capable of speaking a more monolectal variety of Sananantongo, but the present form of Sananantongo includes by default large portions of Dutch you know, elements and of course, contact phenomena. So you will have sentences that actually just mirror a Dutch sentence, but they use a Sananantongo vocabulary and lexicon, right? So you have this one-to-one -one translations or idioms, idiomatic translations and from, from Dutch. So 
this is, I think, very typical for Creoles. Why, why is this the case? And this is where I would really differentiate this from the law of Nguam um, and also some of the other rural uh, Ghanaian scenarios uh, where lang languages are certainly kept more apart or Cameroon, where I've also worked not in Pia Paolo's area, but on the coast uh, in, in Buea and, and Kumba and Bamenda working on, on, on Cameroon pigeon. Um, the Creoles, you have to see how, where they arose. They arose in, in these contexts of um, hyper exploitation, right? Colonialism, the, the concentration camp like situations of the plantation, right? Where everything African, uh, everything black was derided, demoted, minoritized, marginalized, right? So in a way, of course, the Creole languages uh, show a continuation of African linguistic practices with another mean, namely with another means, namely by, by clothing more or less African linguistic practices and multilingual practices and, and polyglossic practices inherited from West Africa in a new pair of clothing, namely English lexicon or English derived lexicon. But it doesn't mean that these practices stop, of course, right? They were trans translated and, and carried on by, by successive generations of African descended um, people in the Americas, of course, also indigenous traditions in Suriname, where you know a lot of indigenous people in Suriname um, also use Tranantongo, the Creole, as their as their main community language, but identify as indigenous communities, right? So they are culturally they identify as indigenous, but linguistically they speak Tranantongo and they, they don't use their language anymore. You have a, a number of community, uh, a number of communities like that. Right, so, so it's interesting that in that context, the Creole languages, they kind of are, are deeply, deeply imbibed with this kind of multi or polyglossic ideology per se, because you suddenly had to represent what was once multilingual practices of Africans who have been deported to the Americas with a variable and fluid linguistic system, but basically it was one system replacing many others, right? But the edges of that system are blurred. So people can bring in their own individual linguistic experiences in Suriname, people with an Indian background, Indian, uh, the Indian diaspora of Suriname speaks Rananthongo, the same in Trinidad where Indo-Trinidadians uh, or in Guyana where Indo-Guyanese speak the Creole as their primary community language. They don't speak any Indic language anymore, in that case, Bojpuri, right? So, so it's interesting to see how these kind of multiplicities of identities can be expressed with a system that reflects that, that historical experience of multilingualism, but in ways that kind of reflect the variation you find within that one system. Um, and I think people perceive it as one system. I don't think a Pichi speaker thinks he or she is really switching between Spanish and Pichi all the time. They don't care. They, they, I mean, they speak, they can speak in monolingual Spanish as well. If you go to the administration and you need a new passport or so, and, and then suddenly the communicative context becomes hierarchical because the colonial element has been introduced, right? You need to show that you master the colonizer's language in order to get certain favors from from people or in school, you are forced to speak Spanish. You get punished when you speak Pichi or another indigenous language of, Sur of uh, Equatorial Guinea. Then people can of course stick to a monoglossic rigid uh, template that is more familiar to people who have grown up in Europe. But if it's by their own choice, they prefer to be flexible in their linguistic choices and use these kind of flexible systems. But as I said, there are different types of linguistic ecologies which produce different types of switching or multilingual behaviors. So I think we have to be careful not to, to be too, to, to equalize all these systems and say, well, this is how it works. There, there are many different variations of the same theme. Thank you, Kofi. What is really interesting is that your description of this, this fluid interweaving of a Creole with its acrolect, if you want to call it like that, or the colonial language, it's also very widespread in many African settings I'm aware of and was also reported actually from researchers um, on last week's uh, round table. Um, so you, you find that, and it's really interesting because for instance in Senegal, French is omnipresent, 
but at the same time, it's not really relevant. It doesn't really disrupt the ecologies much in the sense that in a monoglossic code, you know, it is not very often present and exactly in the situations that you just described, but exactly this, you know, fluid discourse that is often described as code switching, which I don't think can always be assumed without knowing the repertoire and the intentions of the speaker and the listener and the whole context is, is also there. Um, so that's maybe something that we should explore uh, in more depth across settings. Um, but now I would really like to move over uh, and kind of go a little bit back to something that Hein evoked. And that was also present, of course, in what you just said about the dramatic restructurings of ecologies that were induced by the slave trade and by European expansion and colonization. Um, and all the violence that went with that. Um, but now I would really like to focus on what caused the most dramatic change in uh, by looking at the Amazon and why were some settings more affected than others. And so perhaps Hein, you would like to uh, continue that exploring that thread a little bit? Yes, thank you, Federica. Um, I already talked about it uh, to some extent huh? in, in what's happened in Rondonia in southwestern Amazon. Uh, it's a region indeed where, uh, where probably there was small scale multilingualism. Um, you, the, I think the, the, the small scale multilingualism in that region was different from what you find uh, still in West Africa, and certainly also what you find in the Northwest Amazon. Uh, I have no, I've not found any trace of uh, linguistic exogamy or traditions like that, or, or uh, specific roles, language roles in certain specific social situations. I haven't found that uh, or relics of that. But uh, what is clear from uh, what people tell, told me uh, and from the reports and from also from the, the traces of language contact is that people, that there were small groups, they lived not so far from each other, they mainly lived on the headwaters of, the, of these rivers. It's a very, very dense river system uh, on the upper uh, Rio Guapere and upper Rio Madeira. And um, people used to, to contact each other in order to, to intermarry. Uh, the groups were small, so that was a reason to, to marry outside of your, your groups, uh, which is still the case, which is still the case with some groups. Um, also, uh, there was trade, I mean, traditional trade for certain types of stones uh, to make axes. Um, and also there were certain resources in the forest, like uh, specific types of bamboo that were suitable for, uh, for arrows, for arrow making. It's called taquara. You don't find it everywhere. It's a specific region. And uh, people would, would have, have these places in common where they would go to to find them and then they could meet each other there. So I have, uh, I have proof, so to say, evidence of, uh, of this in, in loan birds for certain uh, bird species or uh, things like that. It's very interesting. Um, I think uh, people became multilingual. Um, but not, it was not a general uh, fact of, uh, of life. I mean, there was, among the groups, there were definitely several people that were multilingual um, who could also be, be functioning as uh, interpreter uh, in, in, in case necessary. People also visited each other, mm -hmm. different groups, whether they spoke uh, 
a different language or not. They visit each other for parties, for festivities, like Petty told us uh, of, the, of the group visiting the Tuyuka. And um, you would have a kind of game called headball. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt has written about it in his famous uh, book on, on the expedition he did with Rondon. Uh, those were sort of football games, but then played with the head very important for uh, just all over the southern Amazon, this game, and very important for uh, the, the, the relationships between the different groups. Uh, I, could, I should mention that in that little part of, of, well, let's just give the figure for Rondonia. Rondonia is about the size of England. You have at least 25 different languages, so completely different languages belonging to different families. So, they're small but very diverse groups, and the relationships between these groups were, among other things, uh, uh, fixed by intermarriage, but also by these festivities and, and games. There were also other groups that were outside of the system. Uh, we're, we're also speaking of culture areas. So the Nambiquara groups, more to the east, they they did not really participate directly in this system. Uh, even though there are interesting traces of language contact there and cultural traits. Um, anyway, uh, it seems different from the Northwest Amazon and from West Africa. About um, um, lingua franca, nowadays Portuguese is the lingua franca in Rondonia. Um, the, the lingua geral brasilica, which is known also as Nyengatu, did not get there, did not get all the way on the upper Rio Guaporé. But apparently uh, the Makurata Tupi, a local Tupi language has been a lingua franca in that region. Uh, it's not clear to me whether that is really traditional lingua franca or whether it emerged in the early rubber period, right? in, the, in the 1910, 1920s, when the rubber exploiters uh, came in. Uh, the the, the Makurab had a tradition of, of talking to outsiders. So apparently they, they took on the role of intermediaries and, and in that way, uh, Makurab became established and still elderly people uh, remember that. And they may speak Makurab in addition to their uh, to their native language. Um, <clears throat> well, the, the changes in all these traditional systems, are, they're clear. Huh? The, I already mentioned them, the diseases, uh, the, the, um, the appropriation of the lands. People were driven off fertile lands or, 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 they, or they were driven off the, the rubber concessions. Um, um, what should I say? Otherwise, say about this. Yeah, that's mainly uh, what I have to say about this. So, people being displaced and driven off land, meaning also the loss of networks, ecologies, and meeting places, Absolutely. which is something that we see all over the place in, in, in settler colonies, seen it in Australia, we see it in North America. Um, which also means that, of course, any efforts at maintaining isolated languages are, are futile when this whole ecology has been destroyed, both in a literal and a figurative sense. Um, Patty, um, so how is uh, the Upper Rio Negro different from Rondonia, and why do we find more multilingualism there, although it certainly has also changed uh, through social political developments. Yeah, so in the Upper Rio Negro, I think the colonial history is distinct enough that um, the, well, certainly the, the colonial history has been traumatic and intense, but not in the same way as, as in Hondonia. So people have, you know, more or less been able to maintain their, um, their their way of life and their, their, their areas where they live. Um, although certainly over the last de uh, century, in fact, with the rubber boom and um, uh, 
missionary boarding schools, there, there's been intense pressure on many of the regional languages um, and certainly changes in people's living patterns with more people, especially in recent decades, coming to, the, to live in the cities. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I think that the area has maintained a, more of a, a picture that you know, we would, we imagine is comparable to the pre-colonial picture. So it seems like we can get some glimpses. Um, of course, it's difficult to know. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity there anyway, as I mentioned before. And then um, there's there we have centuries of trauma. So in fact, in the in the early colonial period, um, something like twenty thousand people were taken out of the region um, as enslaved people by the Portuguese slaving uh, 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 groups that would go up into the area. Um, so there, there has, I, I don't want to under, underestimate at all or under underemphasize the traumatic history that people have experienced. But nevertheless, um, I think that aspects of the kind of traditional living structure and, and multilingual um, uh, structure that's there have been maintained. Um, but that said, in recent years especially, it's very, it's become very clear that many of the local languages are giving ground. Um, there's a, a stepping stone effect in a sense, such that a lot of, um, so that Tucano, uh, so I, what it seems to be the more traditional pattern is that um, the East Tucanoan languages and Arawakan languages in the region have maintained a fairly e balanced kind of relationship with each other, right? So you have these um, fairly balanced multilingualism amongst in, uh, evidenced in speakers themselves. Whereas, as I said before, the people who live in the interfluvial zones, like the Navajo people, are somewhat lower in this social system. <clears throat> and that seems to be the traditional pattern, as far as we can tell. Um, but now, of course, you have, uh, when when you have had the, this colonial pressure coming into play, um, various factors having to do with the boarding schools and so on, um, encourage Tucano to take on the status of more of a lingua franca. So Tucano has now become essentially a lingua franca in the region other than Portuguese, which is also gaining ground rapidly. But you have a kind of stepping stone effect with respect to language shift, such that many groups in the region have switched largely to Tucano. So the Teriana um, are one example in Eichenwald's work, the Desano, um, the Waikana, many groups have, have experienced this to some degree, and in some cases um, switched completely, and there's no speakers left of those languages. Um, but so Tucano has gained the status as a lingua franca, um, and in many cases, people are switching to Tucano, and then you may get a switches to Portuguese from there. So especially as people come to live in the city, do you have these switches from Tucano into Portuguese and people staying, you know, continuing on with Portuguese. Um, certainly along the middle and lower Rio Negro, there were switches that occurred or shifts that occurred, um, you know, in some cases many decades ago to Ningatu, which was a um, Tupi Guarani language brought in as a lingua franca by Jesuit missionaries that was very predominant in that region for a long time. So many of the Arawakan languages, in fact, most of the Arawakan languages that were spoken along the middle and lower Rio Negro course are no longer spoken at all. Um, and their speakers shifted to Ninga too, and now most of those people have switched to, to Portuguese. Um, so <clears throat> Um, Bruno Franchetto actually asked an interesting question relating to how these changes relate to the, the practice of linguistic exogamy in the region. Um, and there's been some interesting work by um, Aloysio Cabozar, I think has looked at this, Luke Fleming, Sarah Schulis, um, at how speakers, for a considerable period of time, there's uh, people tend to continue with the, the exogamy patterns with respect to their you know, so-called ethnic affiliation that would be their language affiliation, even if they've switched languages. So a Desano person who only speaks Tucano will still be, you know, obligated to marry out of the Desano community. Um, again, that said, for groups of people or families that have moved to cities like San Gabriel and Manaus, um, even those marriage practices start to disintegrate over time, but they seem to be um, the language seems the language loss has not it's in itself disrupted the marriage practices, although um, there's a lot of interesting documentation of how people feel about their this disconnect, um, given that that language is, you know, so important and still continues to be so important um, in the region for one's sense of identity. <clears throat> 
Um, another a thing I think that's interesting to explore with respect to these changes is that um, there seem to be kind of different linguistic ecologies in place with respect to colonially mediated languages, so particularly Portuguese or Spanish as you get closer to Colombia, and to some degree to Kano, um, and as opposed to the indigenous languages that are you know, part of the, the indigenous multilingual system. Um, and some of those different linguistic ecologies seem to play out even among speakers who participate in both domains in the sense that they, they speak a number of indigenous languages, they're involved in the, the small scale multilingual system of the indigenous context, but they also speak Portuguese or, or you know, maybe Spanish or Ningatu as well. And so you find some of this often the same speakers who seem to be really quite constrained in many contexts, um, and certainly in my experience at least, with respect to code switching um, among the indigenous languages they speak, seem to have no problem whatsoever in code switching with Portuguese. And it's quite common to hear people um, employing intersentential forms of code switching with Portuguese, whereas I have personally experienced much less of that. And, and it certainly seems to be reported in the literature in general that there's much less of that with respect to the indigenous languages. So these kinds of different linguistic ecologies. Um, another thing I think that's interesting to comment on here has to do with um, even the, the kinds of different linguistic ecologies that pertain to um, non, the non-colonial context or the context that we might be able to extrapolate as pre-colonial, um, such that uh, a fascinating thing I think that comes out of these roundtable discussions and other discussions of this kind is thinking about, you know, on one hand, the, the parallels that we see among small-scale multilingual settings around the world, but also some of the differences. So the way, for example, in Australia, it seems that this tie between land and country is really important. In Cameroon, as Pierre Paolo has discussed, um, we have this fluidity of language to index these multiple social affiliations. And that seems to be a kind of anchor point for, for multilingual uh, usage. Um, and in Amazonia, from what I've perceived and, and thought about, it seems to be, and, and others as well, this kind of association between social category or identity in some sense. Um, again, you know, all of these factors are relevant in multilingual settings all around the world. So it's very, diffi it's very difficult to say, oh, this setting is really special. But I think we can identify sort of points, particular points of reference that might vary across settings. And <clears throat> with respect to the, um, Upper Rio Negro context, one area where this plays out, I think, in, in quite an interesting way comparatively, is that if we look at the, the people of the interfluvial zones, so speakers of Nadahoop languages and other, other groups in that zone, and compare them with the people who live in the more riverine zones who speak Tucanoan and Arawakan languages, um, we have an intense interaction and in multilingualism, again, involving people who have um, you know, a kind of a social imbalance and a different orientation towards, you know, more focused on hunting and gathering versus more focused on agriculture, although it's important to note that everybody does both. Um, but if we look at other places in the world, like um, Africa, the Philippines, and so on, there are many, many situations where you have people with a hunter-gathering orientation who at some point in the past have switched languages to that of the agriculturalists who are dominant in the region, but nevertheless maintained their their identity as a kind of distinct ethnic group, maintain their subsistence pattern a lot of the time. So they've just switched languages. Um, and I think that's something we're familiar with in many contexts, including the contemporary Upper Rio Negro, where somebody might switch to, a group of people might switch to Ningatu or to Tucano, but still consider themselves, you know, Pare or Desano or something like that. Um, but the interesting contrast is that in what I perceive as a more traditional Upper Rio Negro context, um, you don't, I, I'm not aware of clear cases of language shift that haven't involved a full shift of identity as well. So it's striking, for example, that speakers of Hoop have maintained their language. They're one of the few examples that I'm aware of in the world where a group of, of people who are oriented towards hunting and gathering but have this very intensive relationship with agriculturalists have actually maintained their language over time. Although, of course, their grammar has you know, has there are many, many examples of, of grammatical convergence. So it's certainly not that they haven't experienced the effects of this intensive contact, but they've maintained the languages. Um, 
Whereas again, in, in other parts of the world, like Africa and the Philippines, we see many examples of, of shift over time. Um, the other thing is that in the Upper Rio Negro, there are rumors or, or cases, reported cases of, of, for example, subgroup whatever of this Cubeo group uh, is reported to have um, to have been a, a so-called Maku or sort of forest people or hoop or whatever you want to call it group that's that was kind of assimilated into say the Cubeo or in some cases other groups um, as a kind of subordinate clan, right? So the the Cubeo and other East Tupinoan peoples have clan hierarchies and the lowest clans on the totem pole are often attributed uh, origin in outside of the group altogether in the, the forest peoples. Um, it, a lot of the time, I think it's not really clear to what extent this involved a shift of, of, of identity or an assimilation of an outside group. In some cases, I think these are just, it, in some cases, from what I understand, these, these may, may well just be rumors, right? Ways to kind of disparage some, some group of people. Um, it's also possible that only one man was assimilated and became the patriarch of a new clan. So it doesn't necessarily mean a whole group has to shift. But what you do find is that even in these cases where shift is said to have occurred, um, that's been the whole group has been assimilated. So there may be a rumor that they they started out as this other people, but it's not something like in the case of, of pygmies or agta, for example, where people maintain their subsistence pattern and, and kind of ethnic identity, um, but just shift language. So that there seem to be some really interesting comparisons and contrasts of parallels, but also differences. Thank you, Patty. Um, what is striking is that it seems that colonization wipes out internal diversity if we can, you know, attempt one generalization in the sense that it violently draws people into larger planes of interaction that are beyond their control and uh, disrupts and diminishes the, the importance of the local, I think. Um, and I completely agree with you that we should investigate more the different links between identity and, and language in these settings, which are also very diverse in, in, in different African settings. Um, I'm mindful of the time because um, we also have a very uh, interested audience and we have a number of questions um, that I think we all would like to answer. We have two more questions that we have prepared, but perhaps we can try to um, give a uh, I will also try to rein myself in and be more succinct in my questions and we attempt to be more brief in our answers so that uh, we have time for the questions at the end. Uh, something that emerged when we were discussing prior to the panel was that we are talking in many cases about uh, people who live in settings where they are minoritized and marginalized and very often excluded from access to education in any languages that are uh, locally used and uh, you know, excluded from access to information. And the COVID pandemic has exacerbated this. And as it has made all crises and all inequalities more visible, has also made this inequality more visible. And um, um, so, I would like um, us to reflect a little bit on how we can create good health information for indigenous and small scale or multilingual communities. Um, so what are the burning issues from your perspectives? I would like to share briefly my personal experience as part of the Liliema organization, which has run a repertoire based literacy program in since 2017, where no language is excluded. So learners can learn how to read and write all their languages. And uh, when the pandemic arrived, we were able to seize this existing literacy to provide written information in many local languages. And uh, we actually conducted a survey among the readers of the campaign and it showed that it was really important that we had information in as many languages as possible so that their neighbors were not excluded and that they could receive the information multilingually. So all the readers read at least two languages, normally one 
uh, language of wider communication, but also the local language with which they identify most. And I said this, that the message was also available in this language, gave the message trustworthiness. And I wonder, Pier Paolo, I think you also have something to say on this topic, because you have also run um, a multilingual uh, health information campaign. Yes, Frederica. It's called uh, Viral Languages. Viral Languages. So the website is viralanguages.org, and I'm just the, the coordinator. There are many people who have uh, actually run it uh, with me. And well, it, the the basic assumption is similar to what you were saying about Iliema, although we were not dealing with uh, written languages. Um, so basically that uh, information may reach and uh, because of people's uh, bilingual or multilingual competencies. Uh, so information may reach uh, these small communities, but one thing is reaching them and the other is engaging them. And, and also, so after um, all the work that I and other people did on um, uh, exploring the values and the echoes, the reverberations of using a certain language uh, in people's, uh, say, sensitivity, um, one becomes more aware that using a language A or B is not just a matter of, I mean, it cannot be left to chance or to quantitative uh, uh, considerations. It's a matter of uh, having more or less likelihood to be actually heard. And so this is why in uh, viral languages, we try to, to involve local language teams uh, uh, of speakers of uh, marginalized, uh, marginalized uh, languages uh, in Cameroon, but also in Pakistan and Indonesia. And also thanks to the collaboration <clears throat> of many people, uh, among uh, whom uh, Brad McDonald from the University of uh, Hawaii at Manoa and uh, his colleagues and students. And, um, and so we eventually produced a, 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 so nearly so more than 80 resources in, 50, in about 50 marginalized languages. And this is just a little drop in the ocean, but uh, I, mean, it's, I think it's important, it's an important thing to do for those who know that uh, using a, a different languages may really uh, affect the impact of a message. Thank you, Pier Paolo. And it's a vivid reminder that, you know, people will take the message seriously if they feel taken seriously. Yes. And that needs to start <laughs> before a crisis. Uh, Hein, you have uh, a sad story to share with us, actually, on um, the spread of fake information in the Amazon, in this context. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Um, well, as you may know, uh, Brazil, had, the federal government in Brazil has, has a bit of a, of a, how do you say that, a bit of a, a not very consistent policy on the virus, eh, on the coronavirus. Uh, the president doesn't really consider it a serious disease. Uh, also, he says the vaccines only for the weak people because uh, uh, the, the, the chloroquine, which is an anti-malarial, would serve the needs, uh, or ivermectin, which is an uh, anti-worm. Anti <laughs> Um, how do you say that again? A vermifugal medicine. Uh, they would. He, he claims that that would be effective against COVID. Well, um, this is fake news. Uh, fake news is being spread by his followers, uh, including uh, the evangelical uh, missionaries that attend the indigenous areas. So uh, the missionaries have spread some very nasty um, WhatsApp messages and Facebook uh, messages uh, that the, the disease is, is really fake, uh, that God will save you, and that the vaccine really will kill you. Um, 
that the, the vaccine is dangerous. So don't take the vaccine. Well, the indigenous people, I think that there are some communities which are really uh, in the hands of, of certain missionaries or for already many years. So they believe that stuff, but uh, many communities also, they know where what Bolsonaro wants, what Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, thinks of the news. They're aware of that. They know where this fake news comes from. And also, they have their memories. Uh, the, the, the elderly people uh, explain to them what happened, explain to the younger people what happened in the early 20th century. The people have memories of, of what it means to have a pandemic disease, uh, like an influenza that for us, it's an influenza, but for them, it's, it's the plague. And um, that has changed, of course. Uh, we have now much more um, uh, resistance, immunity against that kind of diseases. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the fake news is there. Um, not, I don't think most indigenous people will, will believe it, but uh, Anyway, there are campaigns against the fake news, and I should mention a wonderful video message of, of uh, Luciana Storto, who's our colleague linguist, who sent this video message to the Indians, and we, our colleagues, are spreading this to the groups that we work with, in which he explains that the vaccine is safe, etc., for this and that reason. And uh, also, there is an interesting article that appeared yesterday on the website on povosisolados.com uh, from an anthropologist called Miguel Aparicio from the University of the West of Pará, uh, in which he explains why the evangelical missionaries are so interesting in, in going against uh, the vaccines and, and acting against it. Um, well, and um, it, it, yeah, that's an article that's in Portuguese, uh, but okay. anyway, it's, it's, it, may, it may be translated at some point, I, I suppose. We will, we will share the links. At, okay. Uh, yes, so Viral Languages Lilema and the link you sent, and if you yes. can also share uh, Luciana Storto's video, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. Patty, um, you wanted to say something very briefly about problems in selecting languages, indigenous languages for health campaigns. Yeah, so I'll be very brief. Um, and just to note that in the Rio Negro, I think um, one of the challenges is that uh, you already have this this infrastructure within the or, or sort of social hierarchy in a sense with among the indigenous peoples who live there before you even take into account the colonial presence. Um, and so, of course, the people who are more dominant in that social hierarchy in the indigenous context are the ones who um, have now entered or, or become very political politically engaged with respect to the national society, the presence of the national society there. Um, so a big step forward for language rights in the region some years ago was that um, Tucano, Baniwa, and Ingatu were named official languages alongside Portuguese in San Gabriel da Cachoeira. But this does mean that other languages in the region, you know, there's already so much of an institutional commitment and they sort of feel like they've done so much already to recognize these three indigenous languages that there's even more potential for the other indigenous languages to be kind of left behind. And so very much so in the case of Hoop, for example, and other not a Hoop languages where um, these speakers are already not really integrated into the political system. So in terms of distributing COVID information, it becomes very complicated um, in that, you know, you have not only to decide what, whether print versus some sort of oral forms of distribution of information will access people, but then which language will be more relevant depending on which form. So, you know, if you distribute something in written hoop to a community, the literacy level is so low that probably that will be less accessible than if you distribute something written in Portuguese and, you know, the one or two people there who can translate it do so. Um, so it just becomes, there, there are many level, levels of complexity um, and I would like to just highlight that some of my um, linguist and anthropologist colleagues such as Carol Obert and Danilo Paivo Hamos and Bruno Marquez have been very engaged in working on ways to get this information out and to, to not hoop peoples in particular that in ways that are effective and that, that uh, can speak to them not only linguistically but also culturally.
Thank you. Again, um, a telling reminder and an important one that we cannot focus on the message. We need to focus on the recipients and the medium. And coffee has something to say uh, to this topic, I believe, from a West African perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, what COVID is, of course, doing is that it's revealing and exacerbating like the enormous inequalities between continents, between regions, countries, social groups, rich and the poor, racialized and oppressed minorities, and, and, and those who oppress and racialize and so forth. And, and of course, um, in, in that sense, um, we see also new intermediate hierarchies developing. Right, and here I would like to tap into what um, Patient said also about, you know, languages that have achieved some kind of official status, they suddenly become, you know, minoritizing languages themselves. You can see that all over West Africa and all over the African continent as well. And in fact, in the Creole context as well, where, you know, a language like Swahili, a language like Swahili for example, is gobbling up languages in Tanzania and Kenya. Um, and you can see that in Kenya here where you know, in Nairobi, where I am now, where in many families where you have multilingual patterns that were still in place, you know, one or two generations before, everything is shifting to Swahili and English bilingualism, right? So when you devise programs, public health campaigns, it's always convenient to just say, okay, let's just do it in Swahili, right? The problem is it's not the language that most people um, might feel comfortable in, or it, it doesn't represent them. So they might not think that whatever information is transmitted is relevant to them, or they might actually not understand it, right? So, so what we have is that we have a kind of minoritization, different levels of minoritization operating where large vehicular languages, large vernacular languages are becoming in a way, fulfilling roles complementary to those of the colonial languages. And that's, that's troubling and worrying because, um, and in a way you could also ask the philosophical, or well, not so philosophical, but really practical question, how much are these patterns of multilingualism and the use of different languages, code switching, not just somehow epiphenomena of language shift, right? In many of these contexts, what appears to be so rich and diverse could actually just be an indicator of a slow ongoing language shift to one dominant variety somewhere at the top of the hierarchical yeah, pyramid. That's certainly the case with languages like Nigerian Pidgin in the in the Delta region, for example. That's certainly the, the case in parts of Cameroon on the coast, for example, where I'd worked in Buea, where uh, languages like Mokwe, um, um, Isubu, and these languages, smaller coastal Bantu languages, are ceding to Cameroon Pidgin. I don't know how it is in the Lua Fongum. Uh, Pia Paolo will be able to say that, but this is something I've been observing. And this has a lot to do also with capitalist tendencies, privatization of media, the fact that information is being transmitted now um, via rationale of, of a market rationale, the state is withdrawing, the state is no longer programming radio shows or TV through state broadcasting corporations or is not taking control of social media, not control, that's the wrong term, but being involved in some kind of proactive policy of, of, of um, instead of leaving that fully to, to private dynamics and capitalist dynamics. Thank you, Kofi. And it's an important reminder that the big African languages, which are often seen as good alternative to colonial languages, and that also holds for the Amazon, um, you know, the big languages, Tucano and the Creoles, they are actually also colonial languages that, you know, expanded in the wake of colonization and are often also languages of internal colonization. So they cannot be used to empower minoritized and oppressed minorities. Um, we're getting to our last question before we address the questions. And it's what you said, Kofi, is actually a, you know, a really nice um, introduction to this last question. Um, because you, know, you said language, and everybody has said it, you know, language selection is a problem. And of course, we are all very much used to the reply, yeah, but you cannot invest in all languages. It's too complex, it's too difficult. And then we get to other stereotypes about these languages. Like they're not real languages, they're just dialects, they're patois, they're unwritten. For Creole and Pidgin languages, of course, this very old um, 
stereotype that has been debunked by uniformitarianists but still prevails so much that they are languages with a very simple structure and a reduced lexicon. So in short, why should we care about these languages, right? I'm just playing devil's advocate uh, here. So why should all these languages be valued and respected? And what do we lose when we lose these languages and the ecologies in which they thrive? And if you can try to capture your complex response in a one or two sentences punchline, I would be very grateful. And I think Patty was the one to start this. Okay, so I'll try to be very brief. Um, I think in responding to this, I would like to highlight the really classic paper by Ken Hale on Daman in, in uh, Mornington Island in Australia, which was a, um, a ritual language. And <clears throat> he talks about he talks about this language in the context of language endangerment and just how much sort of richness and cultural complexity um, we lose as languages become endangered. But it's interesting that he's highlighting a ritual language. And I think it's important to, um, or very interesting to, to come back to this topic in Amazonia as well and point out that sometimes multilingualism is in fact much deeper and more pervasive than we might even recognize. And one of the ways that that plays out in the Northwest Amazon and I think other parts of the Amazonia as well is through um, special ceremonial and ritual um, lets and registers that in some cases are really quite distinct from the everyday language. Um, and so when you have contexts that are already multilingual in the more um, normally understood sense, often those ritual contexts draw on multiple languages um, and really highlight that multilingualism in those contexts. So for example, in the Xingu region in Brazil where Bruna Franchetto works, she and others have talked about the multilingual song cycles that are that are so important there and so important to speakers and to communities as well. In the Upper Rio Negro, we find multilingual song cycles as well, even involving languages that nobody can identify. Um, so are not even clearly one of the repertoire among the repertoire that they currently have. Um, and then even in situations where um, communities are essentially monolingual, if you look at verbal arts, sometimes you find multilingual you know, essentially multilingualism that you might not even notice. So a great example of this is the Awaguajá people more in eastern Brazil that um, my colleague Marina uh, Magalhães and Vera Garcia have worked with, um, where there's a whole shamanic register that most adults command. It's not just a few specialists. Um, and it's really quite distinct, primarily in terms of lexical substitutions, but really quite distinct from the everyday language. So this is the kind of, of multilingual richness that might not even be that obvious to us it's, it's culturally rich, it's artistically beautiful, and it can often be very important to speakers and communities. So these are certainly things that are, are easily lost and in fact often disappear even before the everyday language disappears. Thank you. And this should obviously be a treasure for humankind as a whole to cherish and behold. Hein, what is your answer? Why do we lose if we lose Moscow multilingualism? Yes, well, uh, I can only adhere to what uh, Patty is saying, really, in essence. Um, in fact, um, but I could just give one example of what's happening in, um, in Gondonia. Um, some languages are still strong, right? like, or relatively strong, like the Aikanao language, which is about 250 speakers. Other languages of the region have 10 speakers or even less. You know, most languages have less than 50 speakers in the region. So uh, the Alcana is still relatively okay. Uh, it's been passed on to the newer generations, but the knowledge of the elderly people is going away. Huh? Uh, and one instance happened uh, late, uh, just recently, um, one of the last players of the traditional flutes passed away, or the last player, uh, uh, because of COVID, because of the coronavirus. And uh, the Aikana flute tradition is a tradition, it's a sort of verbal art. Uh, the, the flutes really play words. They play uh, songs which are never sung, but people know them. Some people know them. Only the elderly people know them. 
the tradition stems from the, the initiation uh, traditions that have already that don't exist anymore. Yeah, people are people don't have that anymore. It, it, only the elderly people remember it, and some of them have experienced those uh, initiations. And during that period, you used to uh, learn to play the flutes, and you used to know uh, what the words to the flutes meant, even though they were not sung. Yeah? And uh, well, this man passed away. He couldn't pass his knowledge over to, to the younger generation. I tried to document parts of it, but it's gone forever. And uh, that's, that's what we lose. And I think that uh, the less, as a very general statement, I think the less we, we are confronted with other cultures and with other ways of thinking, other languages, the more totalitarian our, our cultural self-image becomes. And also uh, our unawareness of that fact. Uh, the less we become aware of what we are losing. Uh, so that's that's sort of what I thought about this question. That is a very important point you just made. That yes, we lose the awareness and the acceptance of difference and the possibility to navigate difference and be united in in difference, which is what small scale multilingual societies are very much about. Um, Pier Paolo, what do we lose when we lose small scale multilingualism? Mm, well, uh, I think most has been uh, said already, much has been said already by by both Hein and, and uh, Barry. Um, what we lose, we who do not practice small scale multilingualism is probably an example to to really cultivate our awareness of uh, of diversity and of ways to be uh, in a way at least from from the from the examples that i've seen a way to to get free from symbolic domination that is something that also coffee was was referring to uh, now with the so capitalistic dynamics and uh, uh, incredibly big uh, social and economic uh, economic changes are um, uh, pushing people towards uh, leaving uh, behind uh, their traditions and embrace new languages or uh, just forget whatever they had. Of course, this is, I mean, I have total respect. Uh, I mean, it's their business uh, mostly. Uh, but at the same time is... Um, is an example of how fragile our our cultural uh, uh, say uh, that is also our our sources of freedom are, and um, and so this is something that that the continued existence of of these uh, uh, of these uh, cultural systems and social linguistic systems uh, keep reminding us, um, and then there is the uh, the. The fact that, uh, so th this is what really strikes me uh, most, uh, that is uh, the importance of relationships that is uh, signaled in, uh, in language use in, uh, in Lower Fungum. Of course, uh, this is not to say that those systems are free of injustice. Mm. I mean, there is, a, there, there, are, there is a lot of potential injustice in whatever human uh, system. And <clears throat> the, these systems do not uh, make an exception. Uh, <clears throat> an exception. But the fact uh, that relationships may be so central in one's, uh, say, semiotic uh, practices, so in one what people want to, what people want to 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 represent uh, of themselves, uh, just make me think of how much this is really. Uh, becoming less and less important uh, for us, especially now in this period where we are in, continuously in front of a screen and uh, with uh, relations really uh, lessened and to, to, to a, a very minimum. Um, I think, I mean, these are two, say, more philosophical points, but uh, more relevant, to, I mean, very relevant to me. Yeah. 
Thank you, Pat Paolo. I couldn't agree more. Relationships and also, you know, the control that we have, you know, to navigate our repertoires and not relinquishing ownership of languages to one overarching authority that decides how and in which context we can use it. Coffee, you have the la. I'm sorry, I butchered your first name again. I seem not able to pronounce it with a closed vowel. Uh, <laughs> so, but you have the last word. Um, so what do we lose when we lose small scale multilingualism? Yeah, I think uh, on the one hand, of course, it's, it's really tragic to hear these stories about really shrinking communities, languages that disappear um, and cultural techniques that disappear, cultural systems that Hein, you know, uh, showed particularly blatantly. On the other hand, it's really interesting to see how even large languages uh, are basically just wiped off the map by, by this kind of monolithic view of language and how the inherent variation in language is also just silenced. Um, let's take the Afro-Caribbean English Creoles, again, that are distributed across the Atlantic Basin, at least 150 million speakers across the Atlantic Basin. These are huge languages, right? A huge continuum of languages. But because they're not standardized, because they are not, they don't participate in, they're not co-opted for nationalistic enterprises and for nation building, to phrase it uh, uh, maybe a bit uh, euphemistically. They're not embedded in systems of capitalist hyper-exploitation, yeah, like English or Chinese. But they're not taught in schools. They don't have standardized orthographies, right? They're, they're language, languages of the people. Yeah? They're not as much embedded in hierarchical social relations, right? They, they, they serve horizontal relations. And of course there are hierarchies, but you know, it's really, these are languages of the people used by people for the people. And, and, and nonetheless, they're, they're marginalized. Where does Afro-Caribbean English lexify Creole appear in any league table of Western hemisphere large languages, right? Nowhere, um, because the language doesn't have a lobby. It's just people who use it. It doesn't have an army. It doesn't have, you know, and so forth. It doesn't have a multinational corporation behind it. So, um, it's very interesting to see that, as a matter of fact, many of the things that we perceive as very complex and powerful languages, literacy, large technical vocabularies, and so forth, are very easily achieved for any language. I mean, you just take a language like Swahili or Indonesian. In 15, 20 years, they developed all the technical vocabulary they needed. When I was in Jakarta once, I was um, with some of the colleagues there at, at the University of Indonesia, and I had this thesis in Indonesian, linguistics thesis, written entirely, written entirely in Indonesian, lying on the desk before me. And I was like, awed, oh, awestruck. I was like, how is this possible? Well, they just developed the vocabulary. It's really not very complex to do that. It's much more complex or even impossible, difficult or impossible, to recreate the intensely rich and complex oral culture that comes along with small scale um, societies. Um, the alternative systems of knowledge production, non-Western medical, philosophical, scientific, spiritual knowledge, you know, social systems, the complex social systems that these languages embed and represent in their language, the greeting rituals, the naming systems, uh, James Isigby mentioned, um, um, you know, uh, naming systems in the chat. These will disappear forever when these languages disappear, and there's no way we will be able to resuscitate them. Thank you. Um, and that also tells us that, you know, entering languages in this hierarchy is not necessarily a way to actually nurture and strengthen these types of sociable language cues. So we really need to think deeper about what we want to do in order to strengthen languages that cannot fare very well, you know, among the sharks. We should have a look at the questions now. And I think names emerged as a very uh, prominent theme that um, gathered much interest. So um, several people mentioned uh, parallels between the systems of multiple names. And um, one question and already a reply was also about the multiplicity of names. Um, 
So, and that was actually, um, that was a participant in uh, Jeff and Piat Paolo's Pam Pam uh, project in Cameroon, who wanted to tell the audience that they have the case of consultant participant in the research who has nine names. Um, so I don't know if anybody would like to answer on the complexity of names and the social worlds and the link to multilingualism, of course. I think I did that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd be curious to know, Patty, what's the, we, we never talked about this, I think. Did, did you find uh, any multiple names in your, in your area? I mean, is, it, is there anything comparable to what I tried to, to, to say about lower fungum in, uh, in your area? No, no, I don't think so. So people, in fact, in a way, it maybe reflects the differences between the Northwest Amazon and Lower Fungum in that people have one name that is their, their, it's hard to translate this properly, blessing name or incantation name or something you could call it, that's the, that's given through a series of incantations, you know, at birth, and that's their, 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 they're associated with their, their ethnic and language affiliation, and it's, it's kind of a special thing then people typically have a Portuguese name. And then uh, people often have various nicknames, but they don't seem to be, uh, at least in my experience anyway, don't seem to be associated with different relations the way you've discussed. Um, although I mentioned before that the Hoop people like to apply uncomplimentary nicknames to some of the mm -hmm. Tupano and visitors, um, which I guess you know, it does have a little bit to do with relationship. Um, mm. But yeah, and it seems to play out a bit differently. Yeah. Um, Christian Döhler had a question to all panelists, um, following up on Patty's description of uh, receptive multilingualism. So the case where one person speaks in one language and the other person answers in another language, but both understand each other. And um, he would like to know uh, whether that occurs in the other panelists' settings. Okay, shall I say something? Yeah, so. <laughs> um, well, there are uh, a few cases of receptive, uh, receptive uh, multilingualism uh, that we have in our archive. Uh, so in the archive of the Pam Cam project. Um, and in fact, we haven't yet explored them in detail so as to be sure of the main hypothesis that comes to mind. That is, that in those cases, uh, the, so the language choice had to do with the fact that uh, both people were aware that the other person could understand. And that at the same time, there were no significant relations to, to, to represent through a language choice. So that was a kind of purely communicative uh, functional choice. I mean, uh, that is what we currently know about uh, receptive multilingualism in lower form. Although it's also to be said that um, that maybe I've seen that Rachel Ojong, that in this chat is called Rachel Atige. And she's not from Lower Fungo, but the problem with multiple names is uh, common, uh, at least, from, from, I mean, problem from my perspective, of, of problem, of course, from my perspective of, of no, the, the, we are used to, in, in Italy, in Europe, we are used to these uh, monolithic names, but this is uh, something that is very local. Um, so Rachel will probably be able to confirm this, but uh, receptive multilingualism appears not to be the norm to say the least, uh, quite rare. Uh, usually when people want to be sure to be understood, um, uh, they try and, and they don't want to stress one relationship, over, uh, one relationship over another in presence of many interactants, they prefer to shift to, to, to use Cameroon Pidgin English uh, rather than any of the local languages. 
Thank you, Pierre Polo. And this is a, <clears throat> a pattern that I've also observed in Casamos. So unless though you have a village assembly uh, situation where you kind of broadcast the message in different languages, um, I've rarely seen receptive multilingualism, but always switch to a shared language. If nobody has anything to say um, about this question, I would like to move to another question, but please raise your hand if you want to say something. Um, so James Sekpe, hi James, um, who already asked, and we have responded to the question about names, had a question for Kofi um, regarding the use of English and I guess a tendency to shift to English in younger generations. So have you ever encountered a situation in Ghana where parents speak a Ghanaian language to their children and they respond in English? Yeah, thanks James for the question. Um, yes, of course. I mean, particularly in the urban setting in Accra, um, the capital, it, I've seen it happen quite, quite a bit in, in families. Um, it's often something that occurs somehow, it passes under the radar. And, and parents, because parents are, I mean, if their children speak English to them, often their parents will also be competent in English. Um, it would be odd if there was no real understanding on the other side. But um, it really happens that children in urban settings, in middle-class settings particularly, more and more would use English as a kind of default. Um, you wouldn't have them switching to Ghanaian Pidgin English, <laughs> not necessarily, right? Because of the status and prestige question and also because Ghanaian Pidgin English is, still has very, very much the characteristics of a youth sociolect. So even though people like me who are not young <laughs> use it, but we used it in our youth, right? So we think, you know, we think we are still young, so we still continue using it. And, and so in that sense, yes, definitely. It's, it's something that you can see in, on the entire west coast of Africa, much more pronounced in the, in countries like Cote d'Ivoire and in uh, Francophone Cameroon um, than in Ghana, but definitely um, shifting to the colonial language is widespread and children are, are driving that shift. And that has to do, of course, with the educational system. There's no valorization of African languages in the educational system. No formal knowledge is transmitted via African languages. So obviously they opt it's a rational choice for children to do that, right? Okay, I saw a question from Bruna Franchetto um, and several comments on the importance of anthropological research, but also one question, uh, I think to Hein, on the possibility of reconstructing or de delineating a picture of a former work for a multilingual regional system. Yes, I saw that question. It's it's uh, it's also my question. Um, I have uh, I remember our conference in Rio, uh, where I presented something about it. But um, um, in the meantime, I'm learning more about the issue of small scale multilingualism, and I hope to encounter some kind of yeah, you call it some kind of indication, some kind of. Um, uh, signals uh, that are characteristic only for small-scale multilingualism and that could perhaps be recognized in what's left over in, in the southwestern Amazon. But it's diff difficult. Uh, we, we mainly depend on, uh, on the sparse written sources from that region, which are very few, and on the memories of the elderly people. and. Um, and, and maybe there is something still in the in the structures of the language or in, in the, the traces of contact that can teach us something about this. It's very difficult. Thank you, Hein. Um, I saw Dora Savoldi had a question um, again about the role of anthropology, uh, but directed specifically at um, Pier Paolo asking to what extent his uh, findings on multiple identities were based on anthropological findings. And perhaps we could use this for more broad reflection on the role of anthropology in, in what we do in our research. Yeah, well, uh, this is uh, a 
difficult question because, um, you know, identity is not just a name, uh, of course. The problem is what is identity? And, um, you know, the, this, I mean, the, the discussion would probably bring us very far because in between there is the problem of uh, what Bourdieu called the reconnaissance. Uh, in English, we call it recognition. So the meaning of one's life is to, to just to condense it. Uh, so to be recognized by the others. So if the question is how did I ended up, uh, so what kind of methods I used to, in, to explore this theme in Lower Fungum, well, um, yeah, I, I held a, a lot of interviews. I did my field work, although it was not that, uh, I mean, I, I spent uh, more than a year in Lower Fungum, in, although in multiple, no, a, a bit less than one year in Lower Fungum, but in multiple chunks. And uh, the, the linguistic situation didn't, I mean, was really, up, up, uh, so the, this, this situation of linguistic extreme fragmentation uh, made it really pointless and a bit, uh, uh, say, frustrating to even think of basing myself in a, in a single village and try to learn the local language in order to, to be able to do much work on this larger picture. I mean, it was, I was immersed in a, in a situation in which there were simply too many languages uh, going on. And uh, uh, so it's based mostly on interviews and on, uh, and on, uh, on genealogies and on insights that I had thanks to the collaboration of really um, smart, uh, closer collaborators. I mean, I had people who I, I worked with uh, daily <clears throat> and they were really, uh, I mean, they, they taught me uh, a lot about uh, how um, identity targets, identity hopes, identity expectations play out in people's life. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Maybe I hope so. Um, I think we have to leave this complex question here, but maybe that should actually be the topic of another round table. Names, identity, you know, also language names and language territorialization, how languages become associated with parts of identity and with places. Um, but we leave it here for now. And I'll take the last question, I think, that we can cover today. And that is from Alex Francois, who wonders if linguistic closeness between languages plays a role in multilingualism. When languages are related or similar to one another, does this shape a special kind of language ecology compared to cases when the languages are mutually very different, or is it relevant? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll, I'll volunteer on that one, um, particularly because for my research area, this is really a relevant question. Um, and Alex really raises something really pertinent there. I have the feeling that in many of the Creole contexts, that I've been you know, familiarized with the, the notion of separate languages. And in this case, English, which provides so much of the lexicon and the Creole is not, is not, is not clear cut, right? So many people will be speaking Creole, Cameroon Pidgin, Jamaican Creole, but perceive themselves to be speaking a variety of English, you know, which, which they can be seen to be doing, of course. I mean, there are many ways of classifying languages, if you want to classify them anyway, you know, classification is one of these colonial enterprises, hunting, hunting and gathering uh, in the colonial way, right? But um, of course, um, and, and that's legitimate. What happens to the languages that are in contact is definitely that um, you do find a difference, for example, with Creoles that are spoken in language in uh, countries where English is not the official language, Suriname, Equatorial Guinea, as opposed to languages where English is the official language, Nigeria, 
Sierra Leone, Ghana, Jamaica, um, where you do see that the influence of English over generations is, is probably stronger than the influence of say Spanish on Pichi or Dutch on Sranan. Because there are so many cognitive links in terms of the lexicon and there's so many patterns that can be transferred smoothly and seamlessly, um, we do find a different type of variational spectrum opening that um, where, where in a language like Pichi, speakers would be aware of actually switching codes or mixing codes, um, a Nigerian pidgin speaker um, doesn't care whether they are switching or shifting codes. And that, that of course has an impact on the long-term development of, of the language, both lexically and structurally. Thank you, Kofi. I think my answer from my personal perspective would be somewhat similar. Um, but I think uh, people navigate many very different planes of contrast. So they can speak several lects that are really only distinguished in a number of very small emblematic features to express particular local identities. But they also navigate languages that are really dramatically different, you know, not genetically related, if we believe that metaphor, you know, or only very remotely gen genetically related. But this kind of what has been described as the Creole continuum, you know, depending on which languages are part of the ecology and of the personal repertoire is, is definitely um, an issue, not just for Creoles, from my perspective, but for all languages. So again, you know, an argument against Creole as exceptionalism, I believe. I think we cannot take any more questions at this point, but we can only really thank our audience and the panelists that I've been asked to wrap up the content of this round table um, in um, a language accessible to non-linguists. I will try, I will do my very best um, and be completely spontaneous um, in saying, so what we have seen today is settings of the world um, that can be looked at in their own right and actually have many um, local specialties that emerge from their particular and unique local settings, but that also have a shared traumatic experience um, that has dramatically influenced um, and transformed small scale lingualism in the last 500, 600 years. And that is European expansion and in many of the contexts actually Portuguese expansion and followed by other European powers. And what also unites them is that now all these settings are located in post-colonial nation states that are built as nation states uh, with official language policies. And if these language policies are multilingual, they are you know, it's, it's a model of ethno-federalism. So you have many nations inside the nation. But what we have seen for these settings is actually that each of the settings is unique in the role of particular languages in a multilingual ecology and in the scope of these languages. Um, so we have seen Northwestern Cameroon where languages are associated with particular political units um, but where also individuals have multiple languages that are linked to um, their uh, ancestors, parents, lineages. And all these play a role in, in multilingual language use. We have seen um, Rondonia um, in Brazil, where we can only catch last glimpses of a state of, of affairs that was the case when the area was discovered um, by uh, anthropologists and um, I think also colonial administrators and the unavoidable missionaries. And where we see traces of a convivial system where people probably had uh, more or less intense relationships with their neighbors um, who were not always neighbors, but also people who married in and out of communities. We have seen uh, the Upper Rio Negro with many different types of localized multilingualism and um, um, an etiquette of language separation 
the language, one particular language is related to um, paternal identity, um, but where there is famous exogamy um, that brings together people with different linguistic identities and also a tradition of receptive multilingualism that P Patty has described where you really, a language is really bound to a particular place and is not used outside that place, even if it hinders communication. We have looked at um, languages that are multilingualism in their own right, right? Creoles and pigeons that are the, they're not really the output of multilingualism. There are multilingualism. They are not contact languages, but they are languages as Coffee has described really beautifully that keep, you know, their fluidity according to their ecologies and the languages that are in them, but that are really also, I'm not even sure you said it in the round table today, but you definitely said it in the pre-meeting or in your, in your beautiful talk that you gave um, in Berlin, I believe, in, in Berlin. <laughs> um, so there are languages um, that don't have an external owner, right? So, and so that means they're not norm oriented. So the speakers can really own them and, you know, do with them as they please. And uh, I think, yeah, we discussed um, actually how these languages in their ecologies can survive in a modern world that has very little room and appetite for convivial multilingualisms, but it's all about uh, control, exploitation, uh, profit, maximized efficiency, right? And not about maintaining multiple relationships and conviviality. And that was it um, from me. Thank you all panelists and greetings again to Stephanie. We really regret that you couldn't be with us. And I hand over to Amina for the final words. And uh, just one more thing, you will find the links to um, websites and programs and articles that we mentioned, I think, in the edited video. And also the call for papers for the second ever small scale multilingualism conference, which we will host virtually in Helsinki this August. Please come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Friederike, for uh, this uh, masterful uh, dealing of uh, multi um, talks and uh, multitasking between reading the chat, uh, organizing uh, the turns in the conversation, and everything. So it was super exciting and uh, very fascinating and everything you said all of you as well so thank you thank you to all the panelists thank you also to the audience um, i recommend and encourage you to watch again last week's um, panel and uh, watch again today's panel as well and also uh, refer you to other talks that we had with uh, Felix Ameka, with uh, Bruna Franchetto, uh, for those questions and others who we invited at ILARA and who broached this subject at, at one point or another. Um, and I think it's a very, very important uh, question that we have um, presented today and, and last week. And thank you, thank you very much for uh, being with us and um, presenting this to the audience. Um, we will announce our next roundtables um, on our social media, not today, so please subscribe to the channel and uh, like our social media, our Facebook page and Twitter. You'll have news about the next roundtables and the next talks very soon. So thank you very much again and uh, see you soon, I hope, on our channel. <laughs>